for that. Thank you for coming. My name is Neil Gornflow. I'm the executive director of Shareable, and I'm here just. Thank you. Hey, um, always nice to have fans. Um, yeah, and I'm just here to introduce the program, right? And, and I feel super lucky to have gathered such incredible speakers and to have have you guys join. Um, so my organization, Shareable, uh, we're, we're the cohorts along with Spur, and I want to thank Spur and Noah and the crew, um, you know, fantastic partners. Um, they, they helped make this, uh, this possible, and this is their beautiful space, a kind of temple to cities and a temple to urbanism in San Francisco. So thank you, Spur. We should give them a hand. And, uh, and, and Shareable, are, you know, we're an NGO, we've been around for 10 years. Um, our mission is to empower people to share, empower communities to share. Uh, uh, we do that through um, a few different programs. We're most known for our publishing. So um, if you go to shareable.net, sign up for a newsletter every day. We have stories coming out about the latest sharing innovations from around the world, tool libraries, public banks, all kinds of cooperatives. Um, you know, uh, more and more stuff on cities. You know, uh, in 2011, here at Spur, actually, we uh, we kicked off, uh, we launched the Sharing Economy Working Group with uh, the City of San Francisco and Spur and many other people, um, and that became the Sharing Cities Movement. And we re recently um, launched a book called Sharing Cities: Activating the Urban Commons. So there's, you can go to shareable.net, download the book for free. It's in PDF form. It's also for sale uh, downstairs. Um, and, uh, you know, besides publishing, we also do campaigns and, um, and also consulting. We help cities with their sharing strategies. And now there are over 100 cities around the world that have a sharing cities program of some sort. So that's, that's really, um, really impressive and a good sign. Um, so, um, uh, just also want to just thank other, some other folks that helped make this, this uh, night possible, the, the Thriving Resilient Communities Collaboratory. Woo! Leslie here uh, in the third row um, is, uh, is in the house from, from that group who we've been part of for years. Um, also the Threshold Foundation and some of our sponsors to Palte, Platform OS, My Turn, uh, Stocksy United, and Seats to Meet. You can check those companies out on our website at the bottom of the footer. Um, and and uh, yeah, let me just quickly go over our program tonight. So after I'm done in the next few minutes, um, I'm gonna invite Richard Rothstein up, um, uh, the author of, uh, of um, The Color of Law, and, and uh, you know, he'll spend 40 minutes, and his talk is based on his book uh, by the same uh, name, which is also for sale um, in the lobby here, if you haven't seen it yet, or, or, um, or gotten it, um, and I highly recommend it. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and so Richard will do 40 minutes on his book, um, and then um, Noni Session will come up, um, executive director of, um, of uh, uh, the East Bay um, Permanent Real Estate um, uh, Cooperative, and, and, uh, and our panelists. Um, and we'll have a discussion, you know, we'll go from the history and then into solutions, right? With some transition probably in there as well. Um, and, and then we'll have a Q&A after, after the panel. Um, and then there, if there's time left over, we'll, um, we'll do little <coughs> breakout groups with each of the speakers so you can, you can talk to whoever you want to talk to and even move between different, uh, different people that you want to talk to. Um, and so let me, um, let me introduce the speakers. So yes, Richard Grostein is, uh, is a research associate at the Economic Poly Policy Institute and a fellow at the Thorogood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He lives in California, where he's a fellow of the Haas Institute at, uh, at UC Berkeley. And you know, as I said, he's written this incredible book, The Color of Law. Um, highly recommend it. It's in the lobby. Um, also, Noni Session. Um, she's a third generation West Oaklander and plus a cultural anthropologist and grassroots organizer. In 2016, she ran for Oakland City Council getting 43% of the vote. That's very impressive. Uh, she, she, through that process, she came to believe that her community's clearest path to economic justice and reduced uh, displacement is a cooperative economy. 
Um, that is a sentiment that uh, I also share, and we share at, at, uh, at, at Shareable. Um, she's, yeah, as I said before, um, director of the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, which is a democratically run, cooperative, people of color led model that is creating permanently affordable housing in the East Bay. Um, we also have Chris Iglesias. Um, he's the CEO of um, the Unity Council. So Unity mm. Council is, is one of East Oakland's most vital community assets. It's 55 years old now. It's a social equity development organization de devoted to improving the quality of life for residents of the largest Latino neighborhood in the Bay Area, Oakdale's, um, Oakland's Fruitdale District. And, and through a place-based economic and inter generational equity agenda. So please check out um, the work Unique Council is doing in Fruitvale Village, which is an award-winning mixed income, mixed use, transit-oriented development. I got a one-pager on some of the work being done there. It looks awesome, and it's a great example of Chris's and uh, Unity Council's visionary leadership. And then we also have um, uh, Sarah Jo Shamba Shambalin, and she's the, the uh, research director at SPUR, and um, she, you know, her research spans a range of policy topics, and she's always aiming to bring better information um, about how to best provide user managed shared public resources. Um, among many other things, she leads SPUR's place type research, which leverages her data science and GIS experience to document how we've used land in the Bay Area. And so the samples of her work are out in the lobby, all those place type posters, that's from her work. And that's just a sample of them. She's, uh, there's quite a, there's a, I think double the number that, that's actually in the, um, in the lobby. And, and that work is a real eye opener. So I hope you, you know, check into it further. So just a little bit before we get started on, you know, why, why is Shareable event, you know, hosting this event tonight? So I, I think we're at a critical turning point in cities and in the housing situation. I, the, the housing crisis has become so acute that a previously, I think, un, almost untouchable building block of the American dream is being reconsidered. The single family home and the sprawl, sprawling suburbs where they're found. As, as Richard um, will detail for you in just a few minutes, local, state, and federal governments went to incredible lengths to segregate white middle class Americans from African Americans, other minorities, and low income folks starting about 100 years ago. In the mid 20th century, white flight to the suburbs was fueled by propaganda and gigantic subsidies while it was made very difficult for minorities, especially African Americans, to live anywhere else but a relatively limited areas within cities or in the countryside. So this helped create a separate and unequal America. And while many of the rules um, of this system have been reversed, we still live with its legacy. I hardly need to tell you that you know, we're still separate and unequal, and even more so, so in some ways, like school segregation. Another critical legacy is the fact that most of the land in and around our cities was set aside for single family homes. You know, this is a resource intensive, low density settlement pa uh, pattern that has helped make housing unnecessarily scarce and expensive. So to give you an idea of what I mean, a recent Sightline Institute analysis showed that you could fit all of Paris in just half of Seattle, yet Paris houses three times as many people than all of Seattle. This is what you call sprawl. So single family zoning, the foundation on which this separate unequal housing system was built is now starting to be reversed in cities and states across the country due to the severity of the housing crisis. And this is, you know, over 40 years after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was intended to desegregate our society. So Minneapolis was the first city to do this um, late last year. Oregon followed suit uh, this year. Many other jurisdictions are mulling this. And last month, we just passed AB 68 in California, which allows up to two accessory dw dwelling units per lot in all single family zone areas across the state. This means that three residences can now exist where only one was previously allowed. 
and this applies to a massive swath of land in most of our cities, including, including the Bay Area, where 75% of urban land was zoned single family. I got that stat from Spur, naturally. So, you know, we, I, I think it's important that we recognize this statewide and nationwide change as a turning point, as a potential turning point, where ha housing justice has been, injustice has been done. We have a rare opportunity to create more justice. Where segregation was created, we can integrate and make sure that public goods are distributed more fairly. Where a wasteful, expensive, and socially isolating settlement patterns created, we have a chance to build a new one that can help us meet our climate targets and meet the UN's sustainable development goals. But these outcomes will not come naturally. They won't just materialize because of this change, right? Upzoning single-family neighborhoods is no guarantee of justice by itself. There needs to be many parallel measures so that, that this point in history turns us toward more light, not toward more darkness. And this couldn't be a more important turning point. Look at our body politic today in this country. Look how divided we are. I've never experienced something like what we are going through right now. And as Lincoln said, so long ago at a historical moment, not unlike ours, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I humbly submit a little modification to that beautiful line for today, that a country cannot stand on a housing system that divides its people. And what does the outcome of this turning point count on? Well, it counts on us. You and I, each one of us, it's up to us to face the truth of who we are and what we've done and decide to do something different. We all deserve better, especially African Americans who have sacrificed so much, who so much has been taken from, and who have gotten so very little. Still, I have a lot of questions to answer before I jump in myself into this moment and try to make a difference. And maybe you have questions too. For instance, will sing single family honer, homeowners build affordable units or just market rate ones? Will they lease their units to people unlike themselves? Will, they ease, will this ease segregation or make it worse? Does this move make single family homes instantly more valuable? And if so, does that exacerbate uh, wealth inequality? Won't this attract even more institutional investors who, after the subprime crisis, began buying up single family homes across the country, right? Is allowing two extra units per lot going far enough? Won't this encourage more Airbnb style short-term rentals? What can be done to assure, ensure this shift may, actually makes things better, gets us justice, gets us more um, equity? And what about reparations? You may be wondering the same or have your own questions like this. I hope that tonight you get some answers or you start asking more questions. And with that, I'd like to invite Richard Rothstein to the stage to begin our program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neil, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming here this evening to engage with me in this uh, conversation. I see there are a few seats up here. Some, some of you who are standing want to. There are a lot, but at least three I can see. Four can come on up and, and take a seat. Good. I've got one taker. <laughs> but she can't sit in three seats. Well, again, thank you. As, as you all know, um, in the, there's one here too. As, as you all know, in the, in the 20th century, Neil alluded to it, we had a civil rights movement in this country. Uh, it began by challenging segregation in law schools because civil rights lawyers figured that if judges 
were too dense to understand anything else they might be able to figure out, that you couldn't get a good legal education in an inferior and segregated law school. And then that precedent was used to abolish racial segregation in other institutions of higher education. And then, as you all know, in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, we prohibited legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. And then the Brown decision gave rise to a movement of activists engaged in marches, demonstrations, civil disobedience. People lost their lives, as you may recall. But by the end of the 1960s, that civil rights movement had succeeded in abolishing segregation and everything from lunch counters. You remember the Greensboro sit-ins, or many of you do, with buses. Rosa Parks is the symbol of that struggle. Interstate transportation, public accommodations of all kind, water fountains, swimming pools. And yet, even though the civil rights movement and the nation as a whole had persuaded the nation as a whole that racial segregation was wrong, that it was immoral, that it was harmful to both African Americans and to whites, that it was incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy, as a democratic society, even though it had come to that conclusion and abolished all of these forms of segregation, it left untouched the biggest segregation of all. The biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. Everyone. I've lived in many of them, many. I lived in New York and Boston and Denver and Chicago and Charlotte, North Carolina, Los Angeles, San Francisco, everyone was residentially segregated, clearly defined areas that were either all black or mostly black, clearly defined areas that were either all white or mostly white. <clears throat> How could it be if we understood that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both blacks and whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy? How could it be we left untouched the biggest segregation of all? It's not that we well, not that we like it, we think it's too bad, but we've never felt an obligation, none of us, never felt an obligation to do anything about it. Partly, of course, it's because it's harder. It's a hard thing to do. It's harder to desegregate neighborhoods than to desegregate water fountains. If you prohibit segregation of water fountains, the next day you can drink out of any water fountain. But we could pass a law prohibiting segregation in neighborhoods, and the next day things wouldn't look much different. So what we've done, all of us, and I mean every one of us, myself included, liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, Northerners, Southerners, what we've done is adopted a rationalization, an excuse that we use, something we tell ourselves that excuses us from accepting our obligation to redress residential segregation. And that rationalization goes something like this. What we tell ourselves is that those other forms of segregation that we abolished in the 20th century, whether of public accommodations or schools and colleges or interstate transportation, any of them, those were all created by government. Those were the product of laws requiring segregation, ordinances, public policies. If it was the federal government doing it, that was a Fifth Amendment violation, civil rights violation, and we had an obligation to do something about it if we took our citizenship responsibilities seriously. If state and, and local governments were doing it, it was a 14th Amendment violation, also a civil rights violation, something that we have, we understood we have an obligation to prevent and redress. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, oh, that's something entirely different. That wasn't done by government, it wasn't done by law, by regulation, by public policy, that just how it happened by accident. It wasn't a civil rights violation. <clears throat> it happened uh, perhaps because bigoted white homeowners wouldn't sell homes to African Americans in white neighborhoods, or maybe landlords wouldn't rent homes, rent, rent apartments to them. Or maybe businesses in the private economy, like real estate agents or banks, discriminated in how they carried out their businesses. Too bad, but it was private activity, not governmental action. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's just that people like to live with each other of the same race. You know, if other race uh, people move into our neighborhood, we flee because we like to be with others just like ourselves. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's just because of, it's an economic thing, because of income differences. On average, not everybody, but on average, African Americans have lower incomes than whites, and many of them can't afford to move to middle class neighborhoods. 
all of these individual bigoted, perhaps, but non-governmental actions and decisions is what's created the residential segregation that we know today and what happened by accident can only unhappen by accident. And we give a name to this rationalization. All of us use it, I did, uh, and all of us I'm sure have. We call it de facto segregation, something that just sort of happened in fact, not in law. Well, I spent many years uh, not on this topic writing about education policy. That was my specialty. I didn't know anything about housing. Um, and during the 1990s and 2000s, early 2000s, I spent most of my time attacking the dominant educational theory of the country. And this again was one that was shared across the political spectrum. It was the idea that the reason that on average African American children have lower achievement than white children, <coughs> excuse me, was because teachers have low expectations of black children. They just don't try very hard. The teachers don't try very hard to educate them. And if only we could force teachers to try harder, the achievement gap would disappear. It was a ludicrous theory. And yet, it was embraced across the political spectrum. Embodied in a national law called the No Child Left Behind Law, which was passed in 2001, promoted by Republican President George Bush, sponsored in the Senate by the most liberal Democratic Senator, Ted Kennedy, sponsored in the House by our own George Miller, the most liberal Democrat in the House, this was a national consensus. And the law said that in seven years, the achievement gap is going to disappear because we're gonna make teachers try harder. And the way we were gonna do that was by testing children more and then hold teachers accountable for their test scores. Well, I wrote many, many columns and articles about this, and why I thought it was such a, a foolish, foolish, harmful thing. Uh, I remember write, writing one column about asthma. As you may know, uh, African-American children and um, inner city, urban neighborhoods have asthma at four times the rate of middle class children, four times the rate. Because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more deteriorated buildings, more vermin in the environment. And if a child have asthma, has asthma, that child may be up at night wheezing, come to school the next day drowsy, sleepless. And I tried to explain, it take a, doesn't take a lot of sophistic, uh, statistical sophistication to understand this, if you have two groups of children who are identical in every respect, same racial composition, same social and economic background, same family structure, except one group has a higher rate of asthma than the other, that group is gonna have lower average achievement no matter how hard the teacher tries because teachers trying harder can't make children wide awake who come to school sleepy. And I went through example after example in different columns that I was writing about whether it was asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or uh, insecurity from parental unemployment or chronic stress, toxic stress, explaining how each one of these caused lower average achievement. And then, so this is what I was thinking about in the early 2000s, and I'm a slow learner. I was quite old by then, as you can see, and it finally <laughs> dawned on me that it's one thing if a child comes to school with asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness, but what happens when you have a school where every child has either asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity? How can you ever expect that school to achieve at the same level of schools where children come to school healthy and well-rested, well-nourished, so on? We well, can't. We did in law, but you can't realistically expect that to happen. And we call places where we segregate, where we concentrate children in schools like that, we call them segregated schools. And the reality is that schools are more segregated today in this country than they ever have been in the last 50 years. More segregated. And the reason they're more segregated is because I finally realized the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So the biggest educational policy crisis we faced was neighborhood segregation. That's how I got to this um, topic. And then in 2007, I happened to read a Supreme Court decision that evaluated the efforts of two school districts, Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington. Both of them made a very token, trivial attempt to desegregate their schools. They gave parents the choice of which school in the district their child would attend, but if the choice was going to exacerbate racial segregation, that choice wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a parent whose child wouldn't make a school more segregated. So if you have an all-white school or mostly all-white school and there was one place left, 
excuse me, in both a black and a white child applied for that last place, the black child be given some preference. Can't imagine a more trivial desegregation plan. How often do you have one place left in the school and both a black and a white child apply for it? But this was their plan. The Supreme Court denounced it, said you couldn't do such a thing. It was a violation of the Constitution to do this. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the controlling opinion. He explained that he said, yes, it's true, the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated. But he said the reason they're segregated is that the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. Well, I thought that was a pretty wise observation, the Chief Justice of Bart, don't you think? Well, pretty, <laughs> pretty smart. Um, and then he went on to say, though, that the reason that the neighborhoods in Louisville and Seattle are segregated is de facto. And he went through all the reasons I just described. Government had nothing to do with it. And if government has nothing to do with it, government is prohibited from doing anything to correct it. Well, I read this decision, as I say, it concerned two school districts, Louisville and Seattle. And I remembered in reading this about something that happened in Louisville, Kentucky, some years before. A white family in a single family home in an all white suburb outside Louisville, a suburb called Shively, had an African-American, the, the owner of the home, the husband had an African-American friend living in the center city of Louisville, renting an apartment. He was a decorated Navy veteran. He had a wife, child, good job, wanted to move to a single family home in the suburbs, but nobody would show him one, nobody would sell him one. So the white homeowner in the suburb of Shiley bought a second home, resold it to his African-American friend. And when this African-American friend and his family moved in, an angry mob of that white neighbors surrounded the home, protected by the police. The mob threw rocks through the windows. The police somehow couldn't interfere, wouldn't interfere. They dynamited and firebombed the home, and the police did nothing to prevent this. But when the riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year jail sentence, the white homeowner for sedition for having sold a home in a white neighborhood to an African-American family. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. <laughs> if the police, the prosecutors, the entire criminal justice system was mobilized to maintain racial boundaries in Louisville, Kentucky. And when I looked into it further, I discovered that there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases here in this community, in Los Angeles, in Chicago, in Detroit, in New York, of police tolerated or protected mob violence that drove African Americans out of homes they had legitimately purchased uh, in white neighborhoods. Every one of those, to the extent the police were involved, was a civil rights violation, a 14th Amendment violation that has never been remedied. And then I looked into it a bit further and I found that it was not just the mobilization of the criminal justice system to maintain racial boundaries, but there were many, many federal, state, and local policies that were explicitly designed, racially explicitly designed, to create, perpetuate, and sustain racial segregation in this country. That the racial segregation that we all know is not de facto, it's an other myth. It's as de jure, as the lawyers say, as the segregation that we abolished in the 20th century. And if we understand that history, then we have to understand that it's our obligation as American citizens to do something about it, do something proactive about it, not just wish it goes away. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to spend a few minutes this evening talking about uh, some of the most important federal policies that were uh, pursued in the 20th century, racially explicit policies that were designed to uh, create segregation. <coughs> the first one, excuse me, I'll, excuse me, I'll, Uh, the first one I'll talk about is, about is public housing, something that um, I think many of us misunderstand. I certainly did before I did this research. We think of public housing as a place where poor people live, a place where there are lots of single mothers with children, lots of young men without jobs in the formal economy, maybe engaged in oppositional behavior and confrontations with the police, lots of deteriorated buildings. That's our image of public housing. That's not how public housing began in this country. Public housing began in this country for civilians during the New Deal, the Roosevelt administration, during the Depression. It wasn't for poor people. It was for working class, middle class families who could afford to pay the full rent of the housing that they, they needed, but for whom no housing was available because there was so little construction going on in the Depression. 
Public Works Administration uh, <laughs> built housing for these workers. You know, we had 25% unemployment in the Depression. Astoundingly high figure. But public housing was for the 75% who were employed. And the public housing built housing for those workers, those 75% who were employed. Not all of them, of course, but projects for, for people like that. And everywhere it built it, it segregated it, creating separate projects for African Americans and whites, frequently, frequently creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. There were many integrated neighborhoods, working class neighborhoods in this country in the mid-early 20th century. We would all be stunned if we were transported back there to see the extent of downtown urban integration that existed. And it did so for a simple reason. If you think about it, you'll realize it had to be. We were a manufacturing economy at that time. I know here in San Francisco it's hard to imagine that, but there was none of this internet stuff then. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, they were making things, and factories had to be located near deep water ports, near railroad terminals, because that's where they got their parts and shipped their final products. So all factories had to be concentrated in a single factory district, or several factory districts that were near ports or railroad terminals. And if you had a factory district that employed both African American and white workers, they had to live in broadly the same neighborhoods. They didn't have cars to drive into the suburbs, they weren't living in suburbs. So we had many integrated neighborhoods. The Public Works Administration segregated many of those neighborhoods with its first civilian public housing projects. Uh, the great African American novelist, playwright Langston Hughes talks about uh, how in his autobiography he describes how he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. It's not how we think of Cleveland downtown today. He said his best friend in high school was Polish. He said he dated a Jewish girl. It's what you would sort of expect to happen in an integrated high school. The Public Works Administration came into that neighborhood, demolished housing, and built separate projects, one for blacks, one for whites, creating a pattern of segregation there and with other segregated projects in Cleveland that built on some informal segregation that existed before, but created a pattern that was so strict that it persists to this day of segregation in Cleveland. This it did in many, many places. Uh, in my book, I, I like to pick on, um, to the extent that those of you who read it know, on, on place, smug, self-satisfied places like this one. Um, <laughs> but another is, is Cambridge, Massachusetts. You may have heard of that one. Uh, you shouldn't feel alone. You're not the only one. Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, the area between Harvard and MIT called the Central Square neighborhood was a fully integrated neighborhood in the 1930s. It was about half white and half black but the Public Works Administration demolished housing there to build two separate projects, one for whites, one for African Americans, and with other segregated projects throughout the Boston area, created, sustained a pattern of segregation that otherwise would never have developed with the strength that it did. <coughs> During World War II, the action of the federal government to create segregation where it hadn't previously existed intensified. The biggest cause of that was the hundreds of thousands of workers who flocked from rural areas and small towns to work in war plants, taking jobs that were scarce during the Depression. If the government wanted the tanks and the jeeps and the aircraft carriers and the ships to be produced, it had to find housing for these workers. They were overwhelming the communities where they, they were working. And the government did. It built housing, war housing for workers. Everywhere in the country it built it, it segregated it, creating separate projects for whites and blacks who were working frequently in the same war plants, but they were living separately in separate projects. And this area is the best example of that because the West Coast had very few African Americans living here prior to World War II. There were some, but not to the extent they were African American populations in the Midwest and the East. Uh, historians divide up the, the migration of African Americans out of the former slaveholding states into the rest of the country into two big periods. The first great migration, which took place around World War I, and that brought African Americans into Chicago and Detroit and Pittsburgh and New York and other eastern and midwestern cities, but not here. It was the second great migration around World War II that brought African Americans mainly from Louisiana and Texas into this area. They came to an area where there was no segregation because there were very few African Americans living here to segregate. But the federal government created a segregated pattern here in San Francisco. It built five housing projects for war workers, mostly in shipyards. Uh, four of them were for whites only, one for African Americans. The African American project they placed in the Fillmore District, 
Uh, the government decided the Fillmore District was going to be an African-American neighborhood. And the reason it picked that one was, was because there were a lot of vacancies in the Fillmore District and, and some African-Americans had moved in there filling those vacancies in the private market. So the government decided that had to be an African-American neighborhood and built a project for African-Americans there. You know why the vacancies occurred in the Fillmore District, of course. Because the government, why? Yeah, yeah the government had, had evicted African-Americans and moved them into internment camps. Excuse me? Japanese. <laughs> what did you say? Japanese. What did I say? Good. Good. I, I'm not, obviously. <laughs> yes. The vacancies in the Fillmore District were created when the, the government moved Japanese Americans out into internment camps. And so the government made the Fillmore District into a black neighborhood. Um, the city of San Francisco um, wanted to build one integrated project. Um, the Navy Department prohibited it from doing so. It said it had to be segregated because integrated housing for war workers would interfere with war production. They might get into arguments when they were working together in the plants if they were living together. That was the reasoning. After World War II, um, there was an enormous housing shortage still. Not only had uh, very little housing been available during the Depression, except for those few projects that I mentioned. Um, the, uh, uh, there was no, no construction being done. During World War II, it was unlawful to um, use, civilian, use construction materials for civilian purposes, uh, except for war workers. So there was this enormous housing short backlog, and then millions of returning war veterans came home needing housing. It was a housing crisis similar to the one we have today. Uh, President Truman responded to it by proposing a vast expansion of the national public housing program. Again, for working families. These were returning war veterans who could mostly pay rent. Uh, they had jobs in the post-war boom. This wasn't a welfare program. <clears throat> Conservatives in Congress wanted to defeat Truman's proposal for expansion of public housing. They wanted to defeat it because they thought that it was socialistic the private sector, they said, should be taking care of the needs of returning war veterans, even though the private sector wasn't doing so. It was building housing only for the affluent, much like today. Um, but they, they thought that um, the private sector, was, they wanted to defeat Truman's expansion of the national public housing program. And they came up with a device that the, a term you may have heard of, a poison pill device, to defeat the 1949 Housing Act. And, and the poison pill devices were opponents of the bill in Congress come up with a, an amendment to the bill which they think can get a majority. And then when the amendment is attached to the bill and it comes up on the floor of the House and the Senate as an amended bill, that same amendment causes a different majority to find the bill unacceptable and the entire bill goes down to defeat. So conservatives in Congress, uh, well, some of you I see you're old enough maybe to remember, he was, he was called uh, Mr. Conservative, uh, Robert Taft of um, Ohio proposed an amendment along the following lines. From now on, no more discrimination, no more racial discrimination in public housing. You can't do this kind of thing anymore. It has to be a non-discriminatory program. Of course, it was a cynical amendment. The um, conservatives didn't want public housing at all, but they planned to vote for the amendment. They thought they could get some northern liberals to join them in voting for a non-discriminatory public housing program. That would create a majority. And then when the full bill came up on the floor of the House and the Senate, the conservatives would flip and vote against the final bill. They would be joined by Southern Democrats, who were all in favor of segregated housing but not integrated housing. And so the full bill would go down to defeat. So liberals in Congress faced a very, very difficult choice. Uh, I'm not minimizing the difficulty of the choice. And I'm going into some detail about this story, because it's exactly the choice that you face today, exactly. The choice they faced was this. Were they going to insist on non-discrimination and ensure that they would do nothing to solve the affordable housing crisis? Or were they going to oppose the non-discrimination amendment in order to get public housing built? I'm not minimizing the difficulty of the choice. The leading liberal in the Senate at that time was Senator Paul Douglas, senator from Illinois. He was joined by a someone perhaps you're more familiar with, a, a senator from Minnesota who is called Mr. Civil Rights, Hubert Humphrey. 
they decided to campaign against the non-discrimination amendment. Uh, Senator Douglas got up on the floor of the Senate, gave a speech along the following lines. He said, I want to say to my Negro friends that you'll be better off if the non-discrimination amendment is defeated and you get the housing that you need than you will be if the non-discrimination is passed, amendment is passed and you get no housing at all. Well, he persuaded his liberal colleagues to vote against the amendment. The amendment was defeated. The federal government used that vote in Congress against non-discrimination in public housing as its justification for continuing to segregate all federal housing programs pretty much for the next 15 years. Under the 1949 Housing Act, the vast expansion of public housing that we're familiar with, all of you are familiar with today, all over the country probably, you know the giant, well here in this community certainly, but also uh, perhaps the more famous ones are the ones of Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago or Cabrini Green or Pruitt Igo in St. Louis, these were all built. Pruitt Igo was two projects. Pruitt was for African Americans. Igo was for whites. Um, and this was the case uh, throughout the country. It's not because, uh, you know, Pruitt, uh, African Americans somehow like the sound of Pruitt, do they? I don't know, maybe uh, they, uh, whites like the sound of Igo, so they self segregate. This was an explicit racial designation of these projects. I'm not so sure that Douglas was right, that we were better off, although I say I don't minimize the difficulty of his choice as a result of the concentration of African Americans in public housing. I'll explain how that happened in a minute. That resulted from this vote. Um, we have not only the achievement gap that I described before in schools that results from concentrating the most disadvantaged young people in single schools, single neighborhoods, it results in health disparities between African Americans and whites. African Americans, so many of them, live in less healthy neighborhoods, more polluted neighborhoods, uh, have higher rates of heart disease, shorter life expectancies. It results in the mass incarceration crisis that we have today because we wouldn't have it if we weren't concentrating the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods where they can engage in the kinds of confrontations with police that police sometimes provoke. And I think, and uh, I think Neil alluded to this before, I think another consequence of that choice that Douglas made is the very, very dangerous political polarization that we have in this country today, frightening. Frightening political polarization that threatens our very existence as a democracy. Because how can we ever but think that we can preserve for very long this democracy? You can see what the threat's under now. If so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other, they have no ability to empathize with each other, understand each other's life experiences. How can we ever build a common national identity in, that, on, in an apartheid society? Well, those are the consequences of this choice, and we make exactly the same choice today. We have affordable housing programs, there are not, not enough of them. The biggest one is something called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit that subsidizes developers to build housing for low-income families. Those projects are disproportionately placed in already low-income segregated neighborhoods, reinforcing their segregation, because it's easier. Same reason that Douglas made his argument. It's easier to create segregated housing than non-segregated housing. Developers would rather build in those neighborhoods because they don't have to hold 100 community meetings explaining to people why they're bringing black and brown people into their neighborhood. There's no community opposition. Land is cheaper there. They can put a sign in the window uh, uh, advertising a for rent, uh, an apartment for rent, and eligible people be walking by. Wouldn't happen in a high opportunity community. So they prefer to build there. It's exactly the same kind of reasoning that Douglas used. And so we are continuing to make that choice and perpetuate segregation by doing so. Well, very soon after this vast expansion of public housing took place, a development occurred that was surprising to many housing experts, I think to all housing experts really, <coughs> and that is that all the white projects developed large numbers of vacancies. The black projects had long waiting lists. These were all returning war veterans mostly who um, had jobs in the post-war economy. Why did the white projects develop large numbers of vacancies and the blacks have um, black projects long waiting lists? Pretty soon the the situation became so untenable, untenable, even the most bigoted public housing official had to open up all the projects to African Americans, couldn't have justify a situation where some of his projects were half empty and others had long waiting lists. Soon the projects became predominantly, overwhelmingly African American, and very, at about the same time, 
and some of you will know this, or this economic history, about the same time, those factories that I described before that had to be located in the urban areas because they needed to be near ports and, and, and railroad terminals moved out of the cities because the highways were being built and they could get their parts and ship their final products by truck. Once they did that, the good jobs that the public housing residents were depending upon disappeared. People in public housing, predominantly black, became poorer and poorer. The government had to the first time, had to, for the first time, began to subsidize the projects. People were no longer paying the full cost of the projects and their rent. Once they did that, the government stopped maintaining them. Uh, they began to deteriorate and we got the kinds of urban public slums that we associate with public housing today. Well, the question is, why did all the vacancies develop in the white projects and not in the black ones? And that was largely because of another federal program that was even more powerful in creating segregation in this country than the public housing program. And that was a racially explicit program of the Federal Housing Administration to move white working class families out of urban areas into single family homes in the suburbs. This was a racially explicit program and you know all these projects. You were there here in this area, the, uh, probably the best known in this area, uh, little boxes on the hillside south of uh, San Francisco, uh, Westlake and Daly City, uh, 15,000 homes in that suburb built in mid-20th century. On the east coast, the most famous is Levittown, 17,000 homes uh, built uh, east of New York City. Uh, where was uh, Henry Dolger was the builder of, the, of Westlake, uh, south of uh, San Francisco in Daly City. Where was he going to get the capital to build 15,000 homes in one place? No bank would be crazy enough to lend a developer capital to build a project like that. We were in a suburban country. The banks thought he was crazy. Who's going to want to move to single family homes in the suburbs? Nobody's going to want to do something like that. You're going to have 15,000 empty homes. He couldn't get a bank loan. Neither could Levitt. The only way they could build those projects was by going to the Federal Housing Administration, submitting their plans for the project, the architectural design, the materials they were going to use, the layout of the streets, and make a commitment to the FHA that they would never sell a home to an African American. The Federal Housing Administration even required places like Westlake and Levittown, and San Lorenzo and San Leandro, and you know, you can name many others in this area, required that they place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. This is an explicit federal program. It wasn't the action of rogue bureaucrats. The Federal Housing Administration had a manual called the Underwriting Manual that was distributed to appraisers everywhere in the country whose job it was to evaluate the applications of developers for federal guarantees for their bank loans. The manual prohibited the appraisers from recommending for a federal bank guarantee a development that was going to have African Americans in it. The manual even prohibited a recommendation of a bank guarantee for an all-white development that might be near where African Americans were living because the manual, in the words of the manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. This is what the federal policy manual said. As I said before, the notion of de facto segregation is utter nonsense. We do not have de facto segregation in this country. We have an apartheid society that was created and enforced and sustained by the federal government. Of course, there was private bigotry that contributed, but without these federal policies, we would not have the segregation that we know today. Well, the white working class families who moved into those suburbs in the um, uh, mid 20th century bought those homes cheaply. They sold uh, Westlake, the first home sold, I think, for $9,000 a piece. Uh, um, in uh, Levittown, it was about $8,000. In today's money, that's about $90,000, $100,000. I suppose you could go try to buy a house in Westlake now for $100,000. Interesting. But you can't, of course. Those homes are now in Westlake, they sell what? For $700,000? And um, Levittown, $400,000, $500,000. The white families who bought those homes gained over the next couple of generations equity, wealth from the appreciation of the value of their homes. They used that wealth to send their children to college. They used it to um, perhaps take care of temporary unemployment emergencies. They used it to, to finance their uh, retirements. And they used it to bequeath wealth to their own children and grandchildren who could then make down payments on their own homes. 
African Americans who were prohibited by federal policy from participating in this wealth generating exercise, of course, gained none of that wealth. And the result is that today, while African American incomes are about 60%, 60% of white incomes, and there's another story behind that, but I'm not going to go into it now, but 60%, it's a big disparity, but it's 60% income ratio. African American wealth is now 5 to 10% of white family wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 10% wealth ratio and a 60% income ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid-20th century. And that wealth disparity uh, is the cause of much of the racial inequality we have today. And you add that to the achievement gap in schools and the health uh, crisis in the African-American community and the mass incarceration and our political polarization, and I think you have to agree with me that we've got something of a problem here that we need to solve. Well, the solutions to redress segregation are well known. It's not, no mystery to do what to do about it. And uh, we can talk maybe later in the question period of what policies are, but we don't need more policies. We know what the policies are. What we need is a new civil rights movement that's going to be as aggressive and militant and as demanding as the one that existed in the 1960s because policies don't enact themselves. Think tanks and lawyers can't make policy. Uh, the only people who can make policy is the people who can force elected representatives to enact them. So we need a new civil rights movement. Um, there is a, a, a group that I'm associated with, the national civil rights leaders who are trying to create a new national committee to redress residential segregation. Um, we expect to have an announcement uh, about it uh, in the next uh, maybe six months. Anybody who's interested in uh, receiving that announcement should feel free to give me their contact information and I'll put you on the list, but that's what's necessary. We don't, uh, like I say, we have all the policy ideas. We could, for example, I'll just conclude by giving you a couple of policy ideas just to show you how easy this is. Not easy to implement, but easy to think of what we need to do. If we understand this history, take the example I just gave before about Westlake. The homes now sell there for $750,000. They sold for $100,000 when African Americans were prohibited from um, purchasing them. Well, the federal government should be buying up homes in Westlake for $750,000 and reselling them to qualified African Americans for $100,000. That would be a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation. And any court, even the Supreme Court, that understood this history, which they do not today, would have to agree that that's a remedy for a constitutional violation. Of course, much more simple things can be done. We should, for example, be restructuring the way in which we implement that low income housing tax credit program that I described before, so it doesn't redress, so it doesn't reinforce segregation. We should also be restructuring the way we implement the Section 8 voucher program, so it doesn't reinforce segregation, because most families who receive Section 8 vouchers can only use them in existing low income neighborhoods, both because zoning ordinances in higher opportunity neighborhoods, which also we should repeal as a remedy for this. Um, prohibit the construction of townhouses and apartments and affordable units. Um, there are many, many things. We should have inclusionary zoning programs, which we prohibit now in, in uh, much of the country. We should have rent control uh, to prevent the mass displacement of African Americans and gentrifying neighborhoods to new segregated communities farther away from opportunity. Um, many, many solutions are available. What's not available, what's not existing yet, is a civil rights movement that's going to demand them. And um, I'm confident that as you and your friends and neighbors, relatives learn this history, that you'll be part of that civil rights movement. So thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>
who wrote the most amazing documentation of all the policies I described is sitting here in this room. And so I want to give credit now to James Kushner for leading the way, me the way. Uh, he wrote an article in 1968 called Apartheid in America, which went through everything I just described, and um, I'm grateful to him. Would you stand, Jim? Thank you. Um, I don't know if you recall this, but I was your discussant at the Goldman School of Public Policy. Um, and I didn't get to complete all my questions for you, so I'm excited to have an opportunity <laughs> to pick up where we left off. Um, I am thank you, Shareable, for uh, hosting this conversation. Um, it's particularly important and personal to me as a third generation West Oaklander. Um, and as a social scientist <coughs> myself, trying to pinpoint um, some really effective places for us to apply our pressure um, in our region. Um, and we are, are we still waiting for Sarah Jo? Is she, will she make it now? Okay. Hi, come on down, Sarah Jo. <laughs> this is our panel researcher, Sarah Jo. Um, and so I'm going to plant myself um, in that spot right there, and we're going to launch into our conversation um, for this brief amount of time. And I hope that uh, when we are completed, all of you take away um, one very important thing. Um, we're asking questions about housing, and we're asking in the context of a market a uh, thing we call the free market. And all of our solutions will have to contest with presumptions about free market and market actors at the end of the day, no matter what the solutions. Um, so here we go. Again, thank you so much, Mr. Rothstein. Um, and I can imagine that um, organizations all over the country are asking you to speak about this book, um, particularly at the time where, at this moment where not only nationwide but worldwide, we're experiencing this trend of uh, what I refer to as reverse urbanization, where communities that were formerly relegated to the undervalued um, urban density space are now being um, removed and displaced with the demands of tech labor and the reorganization of our economy. Um, and so I wonder, I, I myself potentially, having um, read your book cover to cover, I am experiencing a gap between um, your assertions around um, what we were valuing at the time, which is this um, highly coveted um, suburban space and communities being um, relegated to the less coveted space, what you believe is the connection between um, land use and urban sprawl and these phenomena you discuss in your work, The Color of Law? Well, I think they're separate issues. Urban sprawl is an enormous problem, uh, but we could have sprawled African Americans along with whites. Um, it's not the, the urban sprawl itself did not create segregation. What created segregation was the decision, mostly of the federal government, although there were private influences as well, the decision to sprawl the white population and not the black population. Yes, thank you very much. So that opens the way to our researcher, Sarah. Um, Sarah, you can tell us a bit about your work on place type use um, and this great um, installation we have in the back. Um, but, and, and as you do that, can you talk to us, um, as you see it, about the connections between land use patterns or what I may be calling erroneously sprawl, and please correct me on that, 
um, and the racialized displacement that is being experienced in urban areas and this thing we're calling the housing crisis. Sure. Yeah, so I have uh, a few slides for you all. Um, let me give, let me figure out how to work the clicker first. So Spur started some research um, into place types as part of a large project that we're doing, a multi-year project uh, that aims to set a vision for the nine county Bay Area over the next 50 years and a suite of policies to help achieve it. We're calling it our regional strategy. But before we could make policy recommendations around housing and also transportation and, and a host of other issues, we really needed to understand um, kind of the the state of play today, and we needed a baseline and a profile of the region, which is where the place types research came in. Um, so we set out to understand how the land use across the nine county Bay Area is distributed in a way that is comparable for very small areas. So we're talking a half mile by a half mile for the entire nine counties. So we set out to create these, uh, these place types. Um, and there are 14 of them. Um, they range from open space and cultivated lands to primarily housing place types, which is what I'll talk about the most, um, primarily jobs, and then places that are too mixed to be called either primarily housing or primarily jobs. Um, some of the surprising things that we learned in, in doing this research, we didn't expect, is that 80% of the nine county Bay Area is open space. That was surprising to us. Um, Within the urbanized footprint, so that remaining 20%, over two thirds of our land use is devoted to pretty much single family homes. Um, within that kind of uh, urbanized footprint, about 44% of it is a place type that we call suburban edge. And this, these are very, very low density housing that is kind of up against that open space. Um, in, a, in the category below that, which we call cul-de-sac suburbs, which is still pretty, uh, pretty large lots and single family homes, that's about 26% of the urbanized footprint of the Bay Area. So we kind of run in our own circles, maybe our own neighborhoods, go to where we work, see a few people. But when you look across the entire Bay Area at some places perhaps you don't go, we were really surprised by what we didn't know about our own, about our own region. Um, so I hope that that can shed some light in terms of and, and set a baseline for perhaps some of the solutions that I know other people will be discussing here today. In terms of um, how that breaks down racially, it's not going to be surprising. Um, the, the suburban edge place type is very much um, white, primarily owned, uh, owner-occupied housing. So this is where a lot of the, the wealth is, is living. It's higher income, but it's also higher wealth. Um, and we weren't surprised by that, but to see it bear out in this analysis over such a large area um, was staggering. So just to give you some perspective, when I say, you know, 44% of the nine county Bay Area is kind of hard to wrap your head around, but that's 500 square miles, and that's 11 San Franciscos. So that's a really big <coughs> chunk of land and asset ownership. Can I follow up with you yeah. a little bit? Sure. We recognize that the shift that's happening in our urban cities are those folks who have a significantly higher levels of asset ownership are now wanting to live in the um, congregated um, urban density areas mm -hmm. for various reasons, right? So what is the connection between um, what um, your work characterizes as inefficient land use patterns mm -hmm and the current process where folks are asking that cities up zone in order to remediate racialized <coughs> um, and unjust displacement patterns? Oh, that's, that's such a good question. Um, I might defer to some other people as well to answer it because I feel like my answer is not going to be complete for such a, for such a tricky topic. I, yeah, sorry about, is that better? Um, so, oh, here's a, here's a map of the, of the place types. Um, thank you, thank you, Noah. 
so, th so the question about kind of what, how, how, do, how does more mixed use kind of taller buildings intersect with displacement? Is that your question? I'm not sure I understand. Uh, and please, someone jump in if you are um, finding a place that really um, you can dig your teeth into. What I'm um, questioning is the um, assertion from the place-based research mm -hmm. that it is our inefficient use or our suburban sprawl mm -hmm. um, that tells us a lot about the necessity to upzone in our cities to increase density in order to better serve those who have been historically and systematically underserved by our um, housing process. Thank you. Thank you for being that. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, we have such competition for housing and that has driven prices threefold, twofold over the last handful of years. So we've created this fierce competition where people who already have the wealth and who already have the income win. So if we can create more opportunities for more people, then, and that comes in the, in the form of different types of housing, um, I think sometimes we talk about that single family home uh, neighborhoods, um, there's like a war on single family homes, but actually it's, there aren't very many options there for different types of housing, for different types of people with different types of needs and means. And so increasing that offering is one way to help other people compete who haven't been able to compete or have been systematically left out of the competition altogether in the past. Richard. Yeah. Upzoning is uh, frequently justified uh, as a way of redressing the racial inequality we have by giving more opportunities. In fact, it doesn't. Uh, upzoning itself, and, and when Neil gave his introductory remarks, he asked a number of questions at the end about uh, whether upzoning was going to simply, I'm, I'm summarizing uh, what, what he meant, uh, if upzoning is simply going to create... <laughs> technology is angry with us. <laughs> if upzoning is a... Uh, uh, I know, no it's not. Hello, hello. I guess you have to have the screen down for the mics to be up. Hello, the, the robot overlords have had enough. Um, well, uh, can you hear me? Oh, well. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Okay, okay. yeah. All right. Um, if upzoning is simply going to result in um, uh, the creation of opportunities for young professionals to afford homes that are now unaffordable in suburban locations. Uh, and uh, um, I guess my view is that, you know, I supported uh, uh, Scott Wiener's bill last year because the mic is going to go off in a minute now. <laughs> I supported the bill because I thought it was an uh, opening in the discussion. But it was not going to create any opportunities for um, African Americans to move into higher opportunity neighborhoods. We need race-specific policies. And um, saying that we're redressing segregation by upzoning, as Minneapolis did, you know, very few black people are going to be able to move into the condominiums that will be built on single-family lots as a result of the um, uh, upzoning in Minneapolis. So uh, we need race-specific policies. Uh, ups it's not something that people want to confront. It, it's not possible to think that we're just going to have a nice effect of racial justice by uh, increasing density. Increasing density is necessary, but it's not sufficient. And to only increase density without an explicit remedial action for the segregation that we've created is going to reinforce segregation as Neil suggested it might. Yes, thank <coughs> you so much. Chris, Mr. Iglesias, um, CEO of the Unity Council. Um, you guys have done some great work with Fruitvale Village and Casas. Casa Bella. Mm -hmm. Casa Bella coming up. Um, a couple of questions. Number one, was zoning changed in order to accommodate those builds? And what's different about those um, 
housing developments out in relationship to this idea that we need to increase <coughs> density in our community? Um, well, thank you for that question, because it's not too difficult like the other one. Um, <laughs> and Neil, thank you for inviting me. I think, I mean, when I remember when I got the invitation, I read what it was about, and I was like, oh my God, are you serious? <laughs> at night, you can do it at night? After like doing this all day, it's like, oh my gosh. And then I realized Richard was gonna be yeah. here, and I hadn't read his book, so I had to get his book and read it. And I'd heard about the book from a lot of people, and um, specifically uh, Landon Williams over here from the San Francisco Foundation. So he makes all of his staff read it to come work for him. He makes his wife read it, his kids, his grandchildren. <laughs> Get that Dr. Seuss book out of your hand, put this color on the wall, <laughs> read this book before you read Dr. Seuss. Um, but you know, but what would you expect from a former Black Panther? You know, of course, you know, it, it, he sees it, he saw it. And, and, and let me just make it a little more complicated for you. Okay. <laughs> Since it was so easy. Um, and in the work you're doing, and in the developments that you're pushing forward, how does the legacy of exclusionary land use and housing policy shape this work in addition to the relationship to increasing density? Well, I think, so I've been at the Unity Council now for six years and, um, you know, in East Oakland where I was born and everything, and, um, but I worked in the public sector for 23 years and 20 of those years were in San Francisco. So before I'm going back to Oakland, I, was, I worked in the city, for the city at the redevelopment agency for the first 12 years, doing a lot of development down here and working with Jennifer Bell right over there. And she was our attorney, keeping us out of trouble um, back in the days when we were building all the your Buena Center and everything. Um, but you know, being able to, to work in San Francisco and, and just see the options of development and what, the, what they had available to them to, to create these developments and trying to make up for years of wrong, right? Um, the best that they could. Um, building affordable housing, first time home buyer program, all that kind of stuff is just amazing what the resource that they had over there. So leaving that, leaving the city, my nice comfortable job, my nice bureaucratic position, nice retirement and all that stuff, and going to Oakland, not, not to downtown Oakland where there's still, you know, there's a lot of investment and resources, but east and going into East Oakland and just seeing um, what's happening there or what's not happening there. You know, it's basically the farther you get away from downtown Oakland, the, the resources go like this and the needs of the community go like this. And there are parts, you know, now the Fruitvale, I think you've had um, organizations like the Unity Council has been there for 50 years, La Clinica, um, Centro Legal, and all these organizations have been there decades doing this work. And as one of my staff recently told me, um, she said like, the Fruitvale, like people have been tending to the land for decades, right? So, so things can grow there. You know, the Fruitvale Transit Village can grow there. Other developments can <coughs> grow there because it's been tended to and cared for. But if you go farther east, you just go like another mile or another, you know, in the deeper East Oakland, and you go in certain parts, like you don't even realize where you're at. Like, you, I'm like, am I still in like the Bay Area? Um, just because of the neglect and uh, you know a lot of these policies that have happened, you know, generations ago, it's still they still haven't had that kind of change, and that's I think the most discouraging thing for for ourselves, you know, for organizations like myself and other organizations that are that are trying to do that work in, in deeper East Oakland. The huge, enormous challenges that they're up against right now, and that's why I think um, you know I think these gatherings to really throw out crazy, crazy ideas on how do you, how do you address that to really make movement, and I think you know I, I always I always talk about you really need to get into these like these really uncomfortable partnerships. With, and do business with folks that you've ne like never thought about even doing business with to kind of create, to spur that kind of, those kind of thoughts and ideas. I don't even know that completely mm -hmm. change, answers your question, but mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah, I wanna talk a little bit about um, defining what inclusionary housing would look like, right? Um, and how we're thinking about it in terms of the work we're doing. Um, so Mr. Rothstein mentions that initially, public housing was really for the 75% um, that were employed. Um, when we're thinking about building um, inclusionary housing, there are some other numbers that tell us that um, we may be repeating this so-called um, de facto segregation. So when we're discussing the need for affordable housing, 
um, one of your spur researchers, Egon Turblin, um, how much housing should the Bay Area have built to avoid the current housing crisis? He tells us that even for um, units that count as affordable, less than 2,000 per month, we are 470,000 rental units behind. Okay. Um, cities like Oakland are making plans to catch up um, by about four to 9,000 um, what they call income restricted units. However, the income restricted units, um, there are about 15 planned for extremely low income, below 30% AMI. That means about 650 units over the next 20 years for folks who make uh, less than $22,000. Um, and 15% for those 30 to 50% who make about 50,000, and 30% for low income, those who make about 85,000. So we're talking about roughly 2,000 units over the next 20 years. And at 80% AMI, with the average black Oaklander making $35,000 and the average white Oaklander making $85,000, what that means is even these minor um, numbers planned for our larger uh, 20,000, 47,000 that are planned in the next 20 years are actually slated for white Oaklanders. So I guess I'd like to talk a bit about how we define inclusionary housing, um, who it includes, and um, does this sound like um, a continuation of resegregation by way of free market factors. I'd like to just go down the, the line. Well, I mean, actually, this isn't some, inclusionary housing is not something that I've looked into deeply, so I feel like I should pass on this one and give people, the experts, the chance to weigh in on such an important topic. Mm -hmm. So I'll just tell you a quick story when I got to Oakland in 2013. Um, so the village, the transit village was built, in two, it was opened in 2014. And so, and then 2010, um, the Unity Council and the city and BART, they did this complicated land deal to um, buy what we call fa the phase two lot, the 3.6 acres right next to the existing transit village, the surface parking lot. They bought it from BART, went into the city, and then they were gonna deed it to us um, in partnership with Mike Gilmetti um, to build 275 units of housing. This is 2010. 30% um, market rate, 70%, um, uh, no, 70% market rate, 30% affordable. And then, you know, the economy was struggling, so um, Mike walked away from the project, but he left the entitlements with us, which was huge, right? I mean, he just, those are your entitlements, you know, you, you do whatever you guys wanna do with it. So when I got there in 2013, I had a fully entitled site um, right next to the barge station, right? Didn't have any money or anything because, you know, the Unity Council was coming out of the Great Depression just like everybody else in East <coughs> Oakland. And every, people will say, oh no, Chris, it was a, it was a recession. And I'm like, yeah, if you were white, it was a recession. If you were black Latino in East Oakland, and you know you got subprime mortgage and your net worth is zero, it was a depression, right? And those are a lot of the folks that we're working with, right? So um, anyway, so I wanted to kind of get that deal going and see what we could do. Um, but I, t I talked to a couple of the council members then, and they were adamant. They're like, Chris, no more poor people housing. Don't build any affordable. Build all market rate. We need folks that have means to live down here. And I, and I totally understood that, but 2013, it was a little bit, it was a different economy than it is now, right? And it, it started, I mean, it started changing fast, right? The rent started shooting up, all that kind of stuff. So, but that was their position, kind of like, you know, we don't, you know, you, you, we need to get more people with means down here to live down here. So I was, you know, I was a little surprised by that initially, right? I mean, I think I kind of understand now because when you look along, East Oakland, especially along international, the International Boulevard, basically the flatlands, that's where they built all the affordable housing. Not only for the city of Oakland, but for Alameda County. So yeah, San Leandro, Pleasanton, the, build your affordable housing you know, in Oakland along that corridor. So I get that. But now that property is like switched. Now it's the most coveted land, right? Being next to transit, you know, you're in San Francisco in 15 minutes from, from the Fruitvale Barge Station. And, um, and then we started just seeing the, you know, the rents start just going up in the, in the neighborhood. So this naturally occurring market rate housing is already happening, right? So then I think the need was like, 
and we need to build more affordable housing. So we, we were, um, so we focused on, on the 30% initially and partnered with Ebalsi and we're um, finishing the project right now. So 94 units of family affordable townhomes will start moving families in hopefully in a, in a few weeks. Um, and then the remaining, the 70%, we, we, we were trying to make it work as a market rate. But again, the economy was switching and switching and it was just so much pressure and we just started seeing so much displacement. We're like, if we build market rate, are we kind of becoming part of the problem of, of around displacement? Because the rates we needed to, I mean the rents we needed to, to make to make that project work st started at probably around 3,200 a month, just for like a, you know, a studio one, but in the fruit to make that project work. Mm -hmm. And that was crazy. That was nobody that, that's we're working with, right? That on any without our staff or the clients that we're working with. So about a year and a half ago, we, we basically made the decision to switch it. So now, so basic now that's all gonna be affordable housing. Um, and we're very, very close to financing that one right now. But again, you know, the whole concept of are we de facto segregation or whatever, I mean, these are coveted areas to live now, right? So I don't, I don't I'm not sure, I'm just kind of grappling with, I don't, I don't even have the answer, but that's, but that's kind of what we're doing right now. I'd like to make a couple of points. One is that, um, Poor people and African Americans are not synonyms. Lower middle class and working class African Americans are segregated in this country as well. And remedies for segregation need to address those, as, those also. The second point I'd make is, that, and it's another way of saying what Chris was saying, and that is that um, in an area like San Francisco, and San Francisco is not the only one, in many of the uh, many urban areas in this country, the private sector is incapable of building housing, not just for poor people, but for working class and lower middle class families. There is no private sector solution to it. You can't make it pencil out, no matter how much you try. So we need public housing. Uh, you know, the fancy term these days is social housing. But we need public housing that is attractive, that is, um, desirable, you know, the public housing I was describing earlier was the desirable housing available. People wanted to live in public housing. Didn't have the, the pejorative connotations that we have today. We need public housing that's mixed income housing and um, it needs to be placed in all kinds of neighborhoods. And that's the only way to solve this problem. We can't rely on the private sector to do it. And we certainly, say, we certainly can't rely on the private sector with a few subsidies for people at the very bottom of the income scale. Right. Thank you. I have a couple of follow-up questions for you, Chris. Um, one is, and I can't remember if I asked this in the opening, did Fruitvale experience upzoning in order to move your projects forward? Two is, did that um, slow or exacerbate displacement and property um, values. And three, how are you getting these projects to pencil out? Um, penciling out, if folks are not tuned into that in the room, is a terminology that you hear quite often from commercial market actors when, um, in reference to um, building pro formas, the cost of the build, and what ultimately, what kind of units can ultimately be created from the cost of the build. And often we um, lose our access to affordable units through this concept that the projects do not pencil out. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I think, I mean, there was some zoning changes around the transit village when, when they first envisioned it. I mean, it was all pretty much um, surface parking lots, right? So there had to be, the, actually, the, the, the way the street ran through the, the area um, and then, you know, being able to create more density of housing. Now, I always, like, I, I wasn't there when they built the existing transit. That was Arabella Martinez, and I think it was just a miracle that she was able to do that back then, right? Um, and every time I walk through the village, it's like, I think from a community asset, it, it's, it's been kind of beyond expectations. As a matter of fact, there was a study that UCLA did about a year ago on the existing transit village and its benefits to the community around educational attainment, health outcomes is very, very positive. Um, from a real estate perspective, I think it's been struggling since the day it opened, right? And one of the things when I first got to the Unity Council, they warned me, like, you know, 
the bond's going to run out. City, City Bank, I shouldn't say the bank. I don't know if there are any bankers here, but I have a whole different uh, um, uh, relationship with banks now that I've been at this job for six years, um, and I won't, I won't talk too bad about them in case there's any bankers here. But, you know, they, they were one of the early investors in the transit village. They had a bond on it, on it right? And I was warned, it, you know, at the end of whatever was last, 2018, the bond expires. And if, if they pull it, it's going to really cause a big financial issue. And sure enough, they were going to pull it. And I was like, well, you know, you guys have been touting this project. If you guys were a partner, why would you pull it? <laughs> well, we don't, we don't do those kind of products anymore, so we need to get it out there. Yeah. And I'm like, well, then obviously you could help me refinance it, right? Yeah. Um, no, no, we, we'd never finance a transit village. It's just, it, you know, we don't have a product that fits that. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, I was appalled because of, you know, I just know they got their nice big tax um, uh, package from the president the year before or whatever, and, but none of the main banks would touch it. We, they, they just don't have a product for that. So we, you know, we eventually refinanced it with LISC and Community Impact Partners. But for me, that was just really glaring, like that, you know, it's a CRA project. It's right next, I mean, it's all these things you think a bank would want to do, but they, no, they're, that's not, you know, and I could get into that, but I'm not going to rip on them too much. So, because um, they still have a nice fountain there and they're still a tenant, so I got to be kind of nice to them. But, um, so, so the, yeah, but I think what, one of the things that I always I wish, I think many of us wish, that they actually built more housing in, in the development, right? There's 47 units, you know, if, if they would have built like 300, you know, I think, um, and most of that's market rate. But market rate, the, the, I think the highest two bedroom, one, one and a half bath in the tra existing transit village is probably $2,100 right now. That's like the highest rents we're charging right now. So it's still very affordable to many, many people. A lot, a lot of students, too. Um, but I think that's one of the things we're really looking at around that area is to, you know, to cre increase density on the, um, on the, I guess, the upzoning. What was the other question part of that? Was there another one? Um, has it um, slowed displacement and the artificial yeah. inflation yeah. of speculative property rates? I think, it, I think it has. I think that the, the, the village and then the surrounding areas has really kind of been like a buffer around displacement and gentrification to a certain extent, yeah. um, which is kind of what we're finding. But again, it's still, it's, it's very challenging out there for, for many folks that are trying to stay. Um, I believe we only have two more minutes. Is that accurate? Yeah. I think we're okay. Um, I had, uh, I guess I'll choose. <laughs> the final question, um, and I will ask it to all of our panel members um, and go down. I'll start from the other end this time, Mr. Rothstein, um, which I think we kind of know your r response, um, but um, do we need to legislate desegregation again, particularly in the housing market, and how can we, when housing as you just mentioned, Chris, is a product that is to be bought, sold, and traded when we valorize and prioritize market actors over the need for stable and rooted communities that are living houses with windows and doors? Well, you said you know my answer to the question. <laughs> <laughs> my answer to the question is it will only be possible if we have a movement a civil rights movement that makes it too uncomfortable to maintain the present system. Because so long as we proceed with market forces as well as well-intentioned policy experts, we're not going to solve the problem. <laughs> but anything is possible if the people demand it. Mm -hmm. oh, you asked about financing. Yeah, yeah I asked right. about commodifying housing and how one creates equitable outcomes when you're dealing in a commodity. When we know that our use and our prioritization of market actors around commodities are virtually unbridled, which is one, um, this um, speculative market we're all suffering under is one of the symptoms of an unbridled free market um, culture. You want me to answer that question? <laughs> like, what page, All of what, them, what page Chris, is that on? What page is that on? Every single one of them. Hold on a second. I think I, 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 I highlighted it. 
I'm not sure. I'm not even sure how to answer that one. Um, when, yeah. You really are passing on that question. Well, I'm just like. I'm a, what does one do when a basic human need is commodified? Housing, water, air, space. What do you do? I don't even know if I have an answer. I mean, we fight, I you know, we, we fight. You know, I think right now, um, it's just, it, it very much feels like a war out there, right? To fight for this, what we're trying to do. And, you know, I think last <laughs> week, there was an article that came out in the paper about um, Facebook, you know, throwing in another billion dollars into the um, pot to support housing and everything. And, you know, I read it and um, I, I sent it, I, I texted it to a foundation, the, one of the CEOs of a found, foundation, and I just like, oh my gosh, serious? More money? You know? I go, and if, I go, from where we sit, we're on the ground, we're doing this work, and it feels like we're in a war. And so, you see like the, the Google money flying around, the Facebook money around, now the Apple money, and it's just kind of like circling around us, right? And we're just like, is any of that gonna land? Yeah. I mean, is it really gonna land and make an impact? Because right now, it's just, you yeah. know, we're on the front lines, we need ammunition, we need support, and that is just kind of floating around, and it's like, it has to start hitting. And I said, I'm like, I don't see that money hitting anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I, that's total BS, right? And you're in the conversations with these people. <coughs> so, you just need to like, there's such urgency to all of our work right now. And that's what, you know, when I go to places, when I meet with people, I could tell like, very quickly if they don't feel that sense of urgency, then I gotta move on quickly, right? Because that's how urgent it is out there. How many of those folks have ever walked through a pile of trash and found that there was a human living in it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I also feel like how can you answer that question about how do you, what do you do when you've commodified a basic human right? Um, there's a, like a classic philosophical question about what's more valuable, water or diamonds, and we've created something that we all need, housing, and we've commodified it, and we've made it scarce. And so we've made it, we've made it both kind of this, something that we, we both need and we can't have at the same time. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know that I have any, any solu solution that I, I think it was really great to hear Richard talk about some of the policy solutions that are not just about the built form, but about what do we do for people. And I think that that has to be part of the conversation. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're going to open it up to audience Q and A. Um, our wonderful Tom will be circulating with a microphone and um, questions with a question mark at the end would be really great. One to two sentences max, it, that'd be super awesome. So my question is, uh, so my takeaway from Mr. Rothstein's book, um, in short, was uh, discriminatory policy uh, equals a greater white home ownership equals greater wealth accumulation over time equals this uh, wealth gap that we're in now, this racialized wealth gap. <clears throat> and so my concern is, uh, conflating uh, affordable housing, which I understand is affordable rental housing, with, uh, with all the progress, because I think there's still going to be a huge wealth gap. So do you think uh, we are being short-sighted when we push for affordable housing in terms of rental units? Because there's still gonna be this long, you know, this long, you know, bigger problem of the wealth gap, or should we just take progress where we can? So that's my, my question. Thank you for that. That's me. Let's go ahead. Well, first of all, <laughs> home ownership is part of the solution, but home ownership is not the only way to build wealth. People who rent can build wealth if the rent is affordable and their wages are high enough. That's right. Uh, savings is also a way to build wealth, and you know, not all people who've owned homes have gained wealth from them. The people who, who owned homes in those suburbs I created generated wealth, but many, not every neighborhood appreciates at the same rate. And people who live in neighborhoods where uh, housing prices don't appreciate as rapidly as others don't gain the same wealth. So we shouldn't look at, uh, at wealth generation and, and home ownership as identical. They do overlap, but there are other ways to build wealth as well, and we need to solve both problems. We need to solve the, the housing problems of affordable rental, not just for poor people, but for working class and middle class families. 
and we need to open up opportunities for home ownership as well. Um, I do have something to add. Do any of our other panel members want to respond to that question as well? Um, I did have a, as the moderator, I've held back a lot of my opinions, but that's one of the things that stands out for me um, is this idea that um, one could buy a house in Berkeley in 1975 for $35,000 and now hold a $1.3 million asset. Um, this concept that um, one of our authors in the room um, um, reminded me is unearned income. <coughs> And the gap between black, Latino, and our white citizens has grown exponentially through the loss of land and housing assets in the underrepresented communities, particularly um, in these ways that, um, as we see in Mr. Rothstein's book, um, African American communities were black from ownership. They had ownership um, legally, sort of extra legally taken from them. And then, of course, we're still riding the wave of the 90s foreclosure crisis um, with these subprime, these, this rash of subprime loans. So some of the work that we do at East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative is think about how to bring, divert um, extractive capital back into communities in order for them to build ownership and wealth. So we're blending a model where we are developing small site housing and building units that would otherwise be rental units where folks put their money into our pot um, and the bank's pot forever. And instead, we are causing these units to be ownership units, whereas people pay down what is now their lease share, they also build capital accounts that they can take with them, move around, invest in a business, put their child through college. So when we're talking about housing, we're also talking about ownership, and we're also talking about community development, which is another way to build wealth back into communities. So we'll have our next question. Oh, there? There's somebody yeah, here I, with the microphone. Let's see. Yeah, okay, sorry, I had the mic from earlier. Hi, um, thanks for the great discussion, and I really appreciate the way Richard was describing this um, need to understand the difference between the de facto, the idea that there was de facto discrimination. And I think similarly, maybe to that question you were asking about the commodified housing, there's a myth about the idea that the market is fair. And I, I, my question is that um, because it's been well established that there's monopoly effects at the lower end of the housing market, so we look at all that existing housing that's for rent, and people are paying really high sums of money for substandard housing mm. in unhealthy neighborhoods, and they're protecting and clinging for housing that's overpriced in unhealthy <coughs> neighborhoods. And so what about this question of the monopoly effects at the lower end of the market and the fact that that you know, shouldn't be okay? That's an amazing question. Um, would someone like to address that? I don't, no, I don't want to waste time by repeating myself. The private sector is incapable of building housing for lower middle class and working class families. Um. Yes, there's a question here. And I, and I would add, if you look at, um, in the very least, city of Oakland's um, downtown and Lake Merritt plan, um, there seems to be a very tight lockstep adherence to commercial builders' presumptions about what can be done and what our cities then believe and incorporate into our city plans for what can be done. Um, I wanted to ask about a dimension that hasn't come up yet tonight, and that's uh, the environment and climate change. And um, Americans consume much more land and um, drive much more than most places in the world, even as um, you know, we're, there we're, we have climate refugees being created now and we'll need places to live. So I'm wondering if that kind of you know, affects the, this question of whether there's, there's sort of a, a you know, what, I, what I would see as a, a moral imperative to create more housing in cities now um, to, to get ahead of that. And there's obviously big uh, justice, you know, implications of, of letting climate change proceed unchecked. 
Deborah, can I refer that to you, yeah. particularly with the land use patterns? Yeah, I think, so one of the things about uh, climate change in our region is that if you, if you look at this map, kind of there are multiple hazards that, that affect the Bay Area. And every time we talk about the set spur, it feels very doom and gloomy. So don't get too sad, but it is a little bit doom and gloomy. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the kind of space where the yellow is touching the green on this map is, is prone to fire. And then on the other side, we have sea level rise. So there's actually kind of a very, and then throughout the region we have earthquakes, but we can't not build where there's earthquakes because that's like all of California. Um, but so when we talk about climate change, we're talking about a few different dimensions here. So ma making sure that the people who live here now are safe and that we're not continuing to double down in places um, where there's gonna be floods um, which happen to be a lot of places that are either low income or people of color or both. And so there's kind of not exacerbating existing risks and the inequities that go with those, but then also if we are bringing in more climate refugees from other places around the world, not exposing them to our risks here as well. And, and these risks are evolving and we learn about the probabilities of them and what, the, what they mean for people <laughs> as we go. Like we know, we know climate change is happening and we know it's real. But exactly what that means and exactly which place is, is a guessing game and it changes as climate change accelerates over time. So it's, it's a great question and one I think we have to keep asking and answering over time. I'd like to stack on that question if someone else doesn't want to comment. Well, I, th I just think, you know, we're, we're building it to free fail BART. We, we've, we've found a model I think that works that needs to be replicated and like you need to double down on, you know, the calls, all these sites around these barge stations, right? Just to, to create more density, which I know, you know, we're trying to do, but I just think that's, that's kind of our, our view on how we're, we're at least very much aware and tackling that the best we can. Okay, so um, I actually live in a community <clears throat> that has traditionally been a, a like working poor community um, where there has been like it's a mix of home ownership and, and, and rental housing and public housing. So I live in District 6 in Oakland. It has a, it's probably the district that has the most public housing projects um, within the city. Um, and our neighborhood is changing in ways of which it's not just it's higher income people of all kinds. So people of color and also white people are buying up houses um, in my neighborhood. And there, re there, wa there was a affordable housing unit that was going to be um, built um, from an out of state um, developer. And all of the new neighbors, they totally protested it. Even though it's been historically a community um, that has had public housing, um, that welcomes public housing, um, but you know, you know, folks that have moved there in the last five years have been like up in arms. I mean, I can't get them, you know, to go to a, you know, a board, like a, a project that has to do with like the ACBA or the Community Benefits Agreement for the A's, but talk about building this affordable housing. Um, project, you know, they 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 meet, they get organized, they go to city council, and my question is, do you all have any whiz like nuggets of wisdom when I'm faced up against people that look like me, um, who who don't want the housing projects there? You know, like we all know it's there for the common good, um, but folks just don't want it there. Yes, and I'd like to stack on top of that one of the questions we didn't get to, which is the bill AB868, which allows two additional um, accessory dwelling units on every location with the, um, I find, erroneous um, assumption that this will let more low income and POC into neighborhoods that were once highly segregated by class and race. So I'd like to hear some of the panel's thoughts on um, our audience members' comments, um, as well as the sense of this YIMBY phenomenon, if you will. Well, again, I don't want to 
take time by repeating myself. Uh, the, <laughs> You know, the, the accessory dwelling units is a form of upzoning, and you're absolutely right. Upzoning in itself is not going to desegregate this country. It's going to provide, up, if, if it's simply upzoning without explicit requirements for racial and economic diversity, uh, it's going to result in solving the housing crisis for urban professionals who cannot afford to live near where they're working in the internet industry. Mm -hmm. Can you comment, Chris, additionally on new members coming into communities like Fruitvale and um, then excluding folks from that opportunity? Yeah, I think with, you know, with affordable housing and um, I think there's one, a lot of it is just perception. People just, they don't understand it, right? You know, they have, they have their own kind of historical, oh my gosh, it might be by, you know, they, whether they think it's public housing or subsidized housing, you know, it's very negative kind of connotations, right? So I think a lot of it is just kind of educating <laughs> on what it, what it is and who's living there. And it's, you know, basically wor workforce housing, however you would want to call it. But um, to me, that's, that's another thing that I felt that I've been um, challenged with, you know, going back and working in East Oakland, you know, the, the perception of East Oakland. It's, you know, especially with a lot of my colleagues I'm trying to get over from San Francisco to come visit. They won't come visit. Like, I have to go to Fruitvale Station and actually get off the train and <laughs> walk into the community. I mean, like, what? You know, and there's such fear. And I'm like, um, like this one guy who built these products right around here, big construction guy, he was coming over to, to visit me. And, you know, he kept calling me like, you know, is it safe? Like, How's this going to work? You know, and I'm like, well, what are you worried about? And he's like, well... My wife said that there was like a shooting there a couple of weeks ago, a couple of days ago. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, there was, you know, whatever, but not, not what we're going to be. And I'm like, are you, are you worried about getting hit by a bullet? And, oh, Chris, that's not fair. That's kind of BS. I'm like, no, I just, look, there's a much higher probability that you're going to get hit by a stroller than, <laughs> than, than a bullet. Because East Oakland is basically the land of families. That's like where, that majority of families live there, right? And this is where they have a chance to grow their families, start their families, and survive in a sense. And you know, the affordable housing is a tool of that. It's, it's a mechanism to do that, and, but big, people don't see that. And that's what I think is a challenge that kind of educate them on that. Yeah, I, I think just the, per, the perception is, how do you myth bust? How do you get somebody to see what's actually happening versus what is happening in their mind? And it's a, it's a, huge, it's a huge challenge. If you have tips for us, actually, at Spur, I would love to know if you learn anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, our organization usually resists being referred to as affordable housing developers, specifically because of the stigma. But what also happens is a compression of the imagination for what we can do and how we can arrange our performance, our build plans, our outcome rents or lease shares. So the, the language itself um, seems to be one of the starting places that creates a challenge for transformation. Do you have another question? Yeah, so uh, first I just want to start, but Richard, thank you so much. This is such a service uh, to this country, the world, tremendous work. Uh, I know you, you've repeated yourself about the, the, the market all, all, all evening, but I, I think can we just name that a market-based system that it, that measures its its success by inaffordability is fundamentally flawed in achieving these outcomes. Not to even mention the racial intersection that we've said, of course, is separate from economic equity. And so this idea, whether you know, we're talking in this room about building wealth through home ownership, wealth is <coughs> predominantly, at least historically, in terms of what we've seen, achieved through the increasingly inaffordable housing stock that we have. And so, uh, that, and, and then my, my question is to your solution in particular, Richard, but for everybody who's engaged in this work, you talked about how uh, we don't have a shortage of, of policy answers, what we have is a shortage of will mm -hmm. and leadership. And where are our solutions gonna come from around that, around building the movement that you talked about, uh, which I, I would imagine uh, includes traditional uh, movement building and organizing principles, but I, I, I'm curious in particular, how do we build the capacity in our leadership, California and beyond, to, uh, to, 
to, to lead on these issues in, in fundamental ways when, as we've been addressing tonight, we're, we're tinkering around the edges. Can we pass the microphone this way to this nice lady okay. in the black? We're going to do one question and I'm going to go back. Okay. I don't know what you guys have, what you guys think about um, those the Fortune 500 com uh, CEOs that came together in August and talked about the you know how business needs to be different. You know I don't know you know but they said that right and um, and it's funny because right after they did that Jamie Dimon the um, CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase came out to Oakland and met with a few of us right I mean I was I. I never touched a billionaire before, and I was able to shake his hand. It was, you know, it was a nice hand, it was soft. But, you know, but he's sitting there with us talking about Oakland and, and kind of really changing the dynamic. So to me, they just like cracked the door open a little bit, right? Just on how they're thinking about business. And I think we have to like just pour through that door, right? Because it's just like a little bit of opportunity that you know, maybe they'll they will pay attention to some of this. So I, I just think it's it's open right now. We have to take advantage of it. Hi, uh, over here. Um, so N Neil made a fleeting reference to reparations. Uh, Richard made a more substantive um, indication that there needs to be essentially affirmative action in the housing sector. So. Um, I'll just pose a hypothetical. Um, uh, you're the next president of the United States, uh, President Rothstein, and you, you suddenly find that there are th uh, three uh, resignations on the Supreme Court. You, you appoint three new members. Um, you, you have a, a solid majority. The Congress is, is on your side, in your, in your party, whatever that party is. Um, what policies do you put, do you put in place um, how does a racialized or a racial justice um, po uh, housing policy work? What, what specific ideas are out there um, in this hypothetical you know, mirror universe uh, of, of, of the future if it were to come to pass after a new civil rights movement? What, what kind of policies could be put in place that would be seen as, as not only progressive but universally fair? Richard, while you're asking that, I'd like the microphone to go this way and create some balance in the room. There are two uh, nice individuals who have had their hand up for quite some time, both in black tops. Thanks. Okay, go ahead. Oh, you mean that yes. Now? yes. Well, you know, if I were president of the United States and I had three Supreme Court justices to appoint, I would do exactly the same as presidents are doing now until I looked out my window and saw 500,000 people marching. Uh, down Pennsylvania Avenue, as they did in 1963, for um, non-segregation and housing. That's what's required. Uh, you know, I said before, I can go through them again. We know what the policies are. Uh, the policies are subsidies for African Americans to purchase homes that are now unaffordable to them and that were denied to them, uh, substantial subsidies uh, that were denied to them when they could have bought them. It's requirements that affordable housing be placed in all communities, not just, you know, the Treasury Department for its low-income housing tax credit program now has a um, uh, priority for placing low-income housing tax credit developments in low-income communities. That's the Treasury Department regulation. Uh, I couldn't change that as, as President of the United States with a Congress and a, a Senate that supported me and three support cream justices. I couldn't change that because there would be the kinds of uproars in communities uh, to oppose uh, placing low-income housing in their communities. So unless we have a mass movement that's going to make it um, politically untenable to maintain the present system, no matter who's in office is not going to change this. And I think it's a mistake to focus on what the policy should be rather than what can we do in our own neighborhoods with our own neighbors to develop that kind of political movement, that kind of civil rights movement. For example, I mean, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I talked in my book about how high school textbooks lie about this history. Well, if we continue to teach children the myth of de facto segregation, they'll be in this poor position to remedy this as we've been. So maybe one of the things before we start worrying about the president should do 
Maybe one of the things we should do is make sure that our schools are teaching the history accurately so that the next generation will be able to act on it. Maybe, um, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, perhaps none of you live in those neighborhoods, but if you live in San Lorenzo or San Leandro or Westlake, take a look at the deeds in your homes. And when you see that, they're, that you're living in a home that's for Caucasians only, um, start to get your neighbors enraged about it and start to build a movement on that basis. So that's, those are the things I think are, more, are a higher priority than um, fantasizing about what you would do if you were President of the United States because, you know, Barack Obama was well-intentioned. It's not because he didn't have the right ideas. He had a Democratic Congress for the first two years. He had, what, three, uh, two or three, three Supreme Court appointments, um, maybe two. Uh, yeah, two, two of Supreme Court points that didn't enable him to do anything because the political support for doing something wasn't there. And that's what we need to focus on. I'd also like to take moderator's privilege and stack another question on top of that, right? Um, Sarah, in your um, place-based work, you mentioned that you're trying to understand how we, and so one question is who is we, can use public resources more effectively um, but many of these resources we're referring to here tonight are privately owned commercial developments that benefit from our public resources, our coffers, our um, low income tax credits, 99-year um, um, leases from cities, um, uh, impact fees in lieu of creating <coughs> affordable housing, which incidentally in Oakland turns out several million, hundred million has not been collected since being passed in 2015, I believe. Yeah. So what to do about these place-based policies where we have um, tried to create more public resources for affordable housing? And I think it's, it's really hard. It's hard, to collect, it's hard to collect and enforce a lot of these policies, and even when you do, Compared to the revenue we collect and the need that's out there, there's still such a <coughs> there's still such a mismatch. So, I think taking stock of the victories that we do have and seeing what we can learn from them is at least one positive thing. And then finding where like pointing out where we're we're totally failing. Like, yes, we enacted this legislation to collect impact fees and build affordable housing. If we don't monitor and enforce that, it's just something that's nice on paper. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the local policies actually begin to, to fall apart is that they don't, they're not always implementable and they're not always monitored and tracked. So the kind of day-to-day -day grind of uh, what is good government and what does it take to be um, effective public servants in our, in our cities is something that um, is not often talked about but is the real work of, of getting these policies to do their job. Okay, okay, okay. Um, my question is, is kind of stacking on top of that, but um, I wanted to ask more about not just nonprofits, but organizations in general. It doesn't necessarily have to be nonprofit. You guys can speak to yours, but I kind of wanted to ask about kind of increasing communication because I feel like there's so many non there's so many nonprofits, but I feel like they're not really talking to each other and creating partnerships to have really united front about affordable housing. I wanted to ask kind of like the partnerships that guys, you guys have to kind of initiate stuff like CRA or you know, other stuff like that. Um, that's kind of my question. Toss it, yeah, a little bit. Um, no, that's a good question. And I think um, we have to do more of that. And you know, even right now when we're developing the Costa Bella in partnership with Ibalsi, right? And you know, when we first started the project, Ideally, we would wanted to do it ourselves, but we, we couldn't, right? So we had to partner with somebody. And, I, and for me, it was important that we partner with another organization that's based in Oakland that has that history that could help us, and they did, and they've been a great partner. But I think a lot of times, these, you know, just now kind of run, running an organization, and, you know, a lot, you're just kind of focused on your work and you don't really look up enough. And that is a big mistake because, it, one, you're, you're missing a lot of opportunities, and I think with, how challenging it is out there on a lot of different fronts. 
we, we have to be able to do that better, right? And I know there's you know, some foundations that are trying to bring organizations together to collaborate and everything, but that's what I think it's gonna really take to, to move the needle on a, on a lot of fronts, these, these, these partnerships, these collaborations. Even with folks that you don't necessarily trust, maybe not even, not even like that much, but they have such strong skill sets that you need, or the folks that you're working with need, you, you, you gotta drop that stuff. That's not, now is not the time to do that. So I think it's, so that's why I kind of call them these un, uncomfortable partnerships, whatever you want to call it, but it's really for the, for the folks that you're trying to serve, I think. Super important. Yeah, and just to add on that, I think that sometimes um, with single issue nonprofits, there's often fighting for scarce public resources where there doesn't need to be so often. At Spur, because we work on more than one issue, we see that uh, people who uh, who want transportation funding and people who want affordable housing funding are often fighting with each other for the same pot of money. And so finding common ground and um, sometimes you have to entrench yourself in a fight and sometimes you have to back away and, and see a big, the bigger picture and knowing when to do which is, is really hard. And I think that, that um, the, having that common understanding, going back to a, a common set of principles and, and, and values kind of helps people and different organizations work better together, so, yeah. Yeah, that question is actually greatly appreciated in our organization, um, in East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Um, we consider ourselves not only an invest housing and land investment fund, um, a worker cooperative, um, a housing cooperative, a community land trust, but also a movement building organization where we're looking to break the silos and the competition between the actors in the field so that, first of all, we can share resources, um, which makes economic action much more potent, um, so that we can exchange skills, um, so that we can exchange community legitimacy and reputation. So for example, our first small site development project uh, was undertaken in partnership with Northern California Land Trust. Our second one undertaken with Oakland Community Land Trust. And our third from a community partner who was a former um, Tesla employee who, employee who cashed in his stock but didn't want to see another plot in West Oakland um, go up with a townhouse, an overpriced townhouse. So that's actually a critical element of the work as you all point out is that we choose to invest in a common goal as opposed to simply organizational solvency or competitive advantage. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm an educator and so I really appreciate your focus on uh, inequity in education and connecting the dots to housing and how that it all ties together and all makes so much sense. Um, you mentioned us needing a new civil rights movement and I want us to remember that youth were putting their bodies on the line in that movement and the youth are going to be the ones in this as well if we can ignite them. And so I'm wondering, you know, I've had students hit the streets because Greta Thunberg got them out there for climate change and Emma Gonzalez got them excited about gun control and Alicia Garza got them out there for Black Lives Matter. Who is the face of fair housing? Who is igniting the movement around this? You're pretty sexy, Richard, but <laughs> I'm saying, like, you got to get <laughs> folks out there who want Ben, this is now. <laughs> but, yeah, so what you mentioned that you have a, a national civil rights group forming. Are youth involved? How can we get youth up there and out there? Well, the reason I'm killing myself running around the country giving talks like this is that you will um, help support, but also it's not only youth. You know, if we look back at past successful movements, youth played an important role, but no movement was ever successful with youth alone. So it doesn't let you off the hook, or any of us off the hook. Um, and uh, like I it's said, called you we, I'm working with um, the people to try to create a structure to create these committees, but most of it's going to have to be spontaneous if it's going to be successful. But if, if you want me to notify you when we're ready to announce things that can be done, let me know and I will put you on the list. I, I'd like to be on that list as well. Um, shall we close or do we yeah, have yeah. time for one more? Okay. I think I've probably time for one more. Oh, yeah. Sorry, just one last question. Uh, 
My question is, uh, Richard, do you feel, or where do you feel transitional housing fits into the strategic design uh, to kind of dismantle generational poverty or kind of tackle the other side of housing that's also needed? So specifically transitional housing, where do you think that fits? I don't know. I'm sorry, it's not something that I really have thought much about. Um, I can comment in the sense that um, we know that one of the ways that you build community strength is that people have somewhere to land, right? Um, about four years ago, the Alameda County um, Center for Disease Control um, officially declared a health crisis in relationship to the housing crisis. So we're not just talking about um, epidemiology in terms of disease control, but we're talking about mental health. Um, we're talking about how that reverberates out into jobs, out into our children's education, out into safety on our streets. Um, and when you're building a movement, it is, if we, if we attend historically to all the movements that have been overturned, it's through the creation of instability in the communities, in the nations, in the government. So if you want to build anything, your community needs stability and it needs a land base to return to, to revive itself, to define itself and a place from which to launch itself and fight. So um, thank you guys so much for listening to these amazing folks up here tonight. And Neil's gonna close us out. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, right, give the panelists a big hand. And, and just a couple quick things to, things to wrap up. If you want to stay and chat with the panelists, please do. Um, also, Richard will be selling and signing books out in the lobby. Um, be sure to catch our series on shareable.net on, uh, on housing pol housing, uh, zoning and housing policy. Everyone that came and registered through you know, Eventbrite will, um, is entitled to get a free ebook. So all of our articles will be wrapped up in an ebook. So look for that. We'll send a message about that. We have Liz Enux right there. Stand up, Liz. Right? She was the editor on this series. And she, we just published the main bar, the main feature story of the series today. So go on shareable.net and check out that story. Talk to Liz. And um, yeah, and thank you very much. Thanks for coming. <laughs>